thank you very much for this uh, introduction and I'm very happy to be in uh, Turin in Torino again. I like very much this uh, seat here. Uh, it is for a privilege for me to talk to you, to exchange views with you, as you are the future leaders, not only of the European Union, but also of the world. And I think that you will make this world better. And you hope, or you think? I think. Ah, okay. I believe. I believe. Great. Normally, I believe in in the students because you know every time a new generation comes on the scene, they get some heritage from their parents, and they try to make this world better. We saw the better world than our parents, and you will see and make the better world than you got from your parents. So, um, today we will speak about the European Monetary Union. In fact, it is my beloved topic. Uh, as Giovanni said, I've studied European integration for many, many years, uh, but I was uh, privileged to be among the first people who started to start the European Monetary Union and to get acquainted with uh, the management of the European Monetary Institute that existed before the creation of the Euro itself, so it was 1996-1997. Um, and so the topic today is um, whether the Euro itself helps the European Union to uh, manage globalization. Uh, first, I would ask you, uh, are you mostly historians, political scientists, or economists? Who are historians? Please do like this. Uh -huh. One. Two. Two. Two historians, political Two. scientists. Yeah. Uh, many of them. And what about economists? One? One. One. Two. 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 Yeah. Two, two ladies, two girls. Yeah. yeah? Ah, that's good. Uh, who have taken courses in macroeconomics? Please do like this. Okay, okay, that is good. So, uh, my suggestion is that when you feel, so, uh, when you hear something you do not understand, just do not be polite, interrupt me and say, you do not understand it. Raise your hand and, uh, you know, you may even shout. Because my role today is that you leave this room with better knowledge than you have come here. So, uh, oops, uh, you see the logos of the University of Turin and uh, the logo of the Institute of Europe Russian Academy of Sciences. Um, we shall discuss how the European currencies uh, behaved on international markets uh, before the rise of globalization, so after the Second World War. Then uh, what happened after the uh, collapse of the Bretton Woods system uh, in the 70s, and then uh, what, how the system evolved in the late 80s and 90s. And then the last point will be uh, our collective attempt to assess uh, the uh, real international functions of the euro. And uh, before we start, uh, could you just tell me who remembers what was the uh, Korean War? Probably students from Asia. Yeah, I'd like somebody from Asia. That would be a face control. Ah, uh, no. So, please. Uh, the Korean War is one of the crises of the Cold War that started after, well, uh, after the Second World War, basically. And uh, since uh, half of Korea was occupied by well, uh, Allied forces, how it was occupied by uh, by, by well, the Soviet Union, and well, the, the one, that's where the division appeared. Okay, okay. When when did it it start the Korean War? 1950. Yeah. And who started? <coughs> who started the Korean War? The North Korea or the South Korea? The North Korea. The North Korea. Okay. Exactly, exactly. And uh, what about? What about uh, China? When the People's Republic of China was founded? 1949. 
1949, autumn 1949, these two things were interconnected. Okay, you are well prepared and uh, it is a good base for us. So, before the rise of globalization, do you know what is that machine? Nobody knows? Yeah? It is adding machine and that is uh, a Russian version. We called it uh, Iron Felix. So before we had computers and calculators, you can, you know, do big calculations with this machine. I tried it once because my neighbor had this machine and I had to make calculations at Mugimo University being a student. Okay, so uh, post-war Western Europe uh, lived uh, in special terms concerning the uh, currencies and foreign exchange markets. First, there was a Bretton Woods par value system. Do you remember when the Bretton Woods Agreement was signed? Bretton Woods Agreements. Yeah? You wanted to say something. Yeah? 1944. 1944. 1944. It is very interesting that the Bretton Woods Agreement was signed before the end of the war. And that changed completely the, uh, you know, the substance of these agreements, because many countries were not attending the conference. Which countries did not and could not attend the Bretton Woods UN conference in 1994? What do you think? No, Soviet Union was among the participants. Think, just think, there were many uh, hands Rising when I asked about political science. What countries could not participate in UN conference in 1994 before the end of the war? Germany. 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 The, Axis countries. the Axis countries, Japan, and even neutral countries like Switzerland, Norway, they were not invited by the, uh, Roosevelt, uh, by the President Roosevelt. Okay, so do you know what is power value system? Who knows? Raise the hands. Nobody knows. So power value system is a system when an international monetary system settled in Bretton Woods when exchange rates, I hope you understand what is exchange rates, yes? Are fixed firmly to the US dollar. And if for instance, okay, let us imagine if, for instance, the uh, sterling is 2.8 uh, for, for one dollar, no, vice versa, one dollar. No, no, sterling is not a good uh, example because they have, uh, uh, they have uh, a uh, reversed uh, rotation. So let it be a uh, French franc. If you give five uh, French francs for one dollar, so this exchange rate is fixed as if it was forever. If France wants to change it, it has to get a special permission from the International Monetary Fund. That is par value system. And it meant that every currency was fixed or pegged, as we say it, I mean we economists, peg just three words, P, E and G. To peg uh, a currency is means to have uh, a fixed rate. Uh, it meant that dollar was the most important quotation currency. It was in the center of Bretton Woods and all other currencies were pegged or fixed to the dollar. So everybody wanted to get dollar because it was the most popular, the most uh, demanded currency at that time and moreover it was the currency of currencies. So fixed exchange rates, uh, exchange controls. Do you understand what is exchange controls? Can, uh, uh, so um, when now you have or you want, for instance, to change euros for Japanese yen. You just go to a certain office, exchange office, and do it. Uh, the banks also do the same. If a bank based here in Italy wants to get uh, Japanese yen, it does it on the foreign exchange market. But previously, 
And after the war, these operations were strictly regulated. Banks and especially you know, ordinary people could, do, could not do them. A bank could do it only if uh, it had a document uh, saying that there is a contract to, for instance, buy something from Japan and if he proves, the bank proves that this contract really exists. Only in this case he could sell French francs and buy Japanese yen. And so the government in any time could change this situation. It could prohibit these operations. So this situation existed for many, many years in Europe. Uh, these are exchange controls, non-existing international financial markets as today, and the European Payments Union that was founded in 1950, nearly on the direct instruction of the uh, American administration, because uh, most of European currencies, or nearly, let us say, all European currencies were not convertible. Do you understand what is not to be convertible? Guys, do you understand? No? You could not, uh, nobody wanted them. And it was impossible to convert French franc into German mark or German mark into Dutch builder or Dutch builder into Italian lira. Because everybody wanted dollars. And so these currencies were not convertible. It was not possible, not only because of exchange controls, but because markets didn't want them. Uh, so this European Payments Union was founded in 1950 and uh, the primary objective was to make European currencies convertible because otherwise it was impossible to reverse or to, uh, to restore the European, intra-European trade. Because if you are uh, a German supplier of machinery and you want to sell it to Italy, and Italy doesn't have German marks and you do not want to be paid in Italian livres, so it is a dead law. And only when currencies are easily convertible you can do it. And so the United States were interested in making European currencies convertible to make the restoration, economic restoration of Europe as quick as possible and also to put the American dollar inside the economic body or machinery of uh, Western Europe. You remember that uh, after the Second World War there was a clear division between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe was somehow governed, governed by the uh, USSR and uh, its allies were Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, what else? Uh, and uh, Baltic states were within the, within the USSR. So, uh, just a couple of words are about the uh, European Payments Union uh, and the Bank of International Settlements. I know it is difficult, but I will try to be as simple as possible. So, the first idea of the European Payments Union was to uh, restore payments between European countries. Let us have three European countries, A, B, and C, and uh, they have trade between themselves. If they have uh, inconvertible currencies, so each of them had to settle uh, trade with the other one. If A sends uh, goods to B for one, let it be 100, dollars or units, so if they do not want to get currencies of each other, in this case B has to send goods for the same sum in A. Do I understand this? Yeah? How do you call these terms of uh, settlements of payments? Have you ever heard of a uh, uh, word barter? No? So barter is uh, a trade when you do not have money. It happened, for instance, in the 90s in Russia with hyperinflation. So you just exchange <laughs> barter for eggs, eggs for 
you know, for strawberries, strawberries for for cigarettes, and etc. It also happened in Germany after the First World War, when uh, the uh, inflation was so high that people didn't want to get money, they wanted to get uh, goods. So to uh, finish the situation, or to abolish, to find the way out of this budget, the Bank of International Settlements, it exists till now, it is in, settled in Basel, uh, started to function as a settlement or uh, clearing, uh, clearing chamber. So uh, the settlements, the trade between these European countries could be not in terms of butter, but A could send goods to B, B to C, and C to A, and then finally, at the end of each month, each of them uh, settled the payments, not with each other, but with the Bank of International Settlements. And so finally, you had one country had to pay 150, the other had to get 50 out of this sum and 100 from this sum. So the total demand for money was 150 instead of uh, 550. So it was a very simple uh, situation, but it needed that uh, none of this country would not have a big current account deficit. Do you understand what is current account deficit? Or trade deficit? Is it easier, trade deficit? Do you understand it? Because if a country has a huge trade deficit and it cannot pay for the goods it has important, the whole system collapses. So, the German payments crisis in 1950-51. The Korean War starts in June 1950. And as you correctly told me, just a few months ago, the uh, People's Republic of China had been founded. And that was a very important event in the international politics because it meant that the communists spread to Asia and that the uh, balance of powers could be quite different from what European, Western European nations and USA could expect at that time. And so just after the start of the Korean War, there was a sharp rise in imports in Germany. And that is a real enigma why it happened before globalization started. Uh, you can bear in mind that uh, Seoul and uh, Bonn, the capital of Western Germany, uh, are situated uh, at the distance of eight or probably ten uh, thousand kilometers from each other. So, uh, but nevertheless, the German had run a great trade deficit just in two or three months. Why? Uh, because everybody expected that a start of a new war, it was actually a proxy war between Soviet Union and the United States of America. The United States of America supported South Korea and Soviet Union and China supported North Korea. The prices for commodities will go up because everybody would need metals and many other things like rubber uh, that was produced in uh, the uh, South Asia. Uh, so both uh, driving forces of the crisis were external. The expectations that Germany would start rearmament and the expectation of high prices for commodities. Uh, here are the graphs uh, showing how the German imports gray line went up, and this is the line for German exports. So uh, German exports uh, increased steadily, but nevertheless that was a period when imports were much higher. And uh, so the European Payments Union had to cope with the problem. What was done? Uh, Germany got a great credit from its partners and only and also from the Bank for International Settlements and finally, owing to the growth of its exports, the crisis uh, was managed. Um, another crisis that was Suez crisis in 1956 uh, 
uh, you remember that uh, for many years uh, the Suez Canal or Channel was managed by the Brit Franco-British Consortium and uh, that was uh, a very important thing for the international trade and international politics because the Suez Crisis shortens greatly the uh, trade way from Europe to Asia. And so in 1955 the revolution happened in Egypt uh, and the new uh, president, President Nasser, said that uh, to uh, develop the national economy Egypt would construct uh, the Aswan High Dam and uh, the uh, power plant, electric power plant. The project was very, very costly and uh, the United States of America and uh, Britain now were uh, countries that with their, through their banks had to finance this project. But in three years, USSR and Czechoslovakia sent arms and military advisors to Egypt. Egypt started to, uh, you know, have close relations with uh, uh, socialist countries. Um, and I know that uh, Russia or USSR uh, even sent uh, military aircrafts uh, to Egypt. And um, then the uh, American banks and the American government said that they would not finance the Aswan Dam anymore because they disliked how Egypt behaved. And moreover, uh, Egypt uh, uh, established uh, political relations with communist China. So that was something that the United States could not bore. And uh, they refused to finance the dam. That was a key point of the plan for reconstruction of uh, Egyptian uh, economy. So uh, President Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal uh, in July 1956. And so in three months uh, after the secret Franco-British-Israeli negotiations, they started the invasion on Sinai Peninsula. Uh, that was, uh, you know, how to say, a performance. They expected that they would invade the Sinai Peninsula and then ask uh, the uh, United Nations to stop uh, the... Uh, to, to somehow to uh, manage uh, the uh, channel. But uh, it would not work, and so the next picture you will have uh, when, uh, uh, when the invasion started, so the president, Egyptian President Nasser uh, sunk ships uh, in the canal, and so the traffic stopped. You see that nobody could uh, you know, pass the channel because of the sunk ships uh, that stayed there. Uh, but our story is not about Egypt and not about USSR and not about uh, China, with whom Egypt established political relations, but about pound sterling. So at that time, since 1949, the exchange rate of the pound sterling was, as you see, $280 per one pound sterling. Sterling was always a very heavy currency, so you had to pay nearly three dollars for one pound. Um, but after the war, this, uh, the position of the sterling was undermined. Why? Because during the war, uh, Great Britain first had uh, great war expenses and it Im imported many raw materials from uh, Southern Asia and from the countries of British Commonwealth. So at the end of the war, its former colonies, members of the British Commonwealth, had huge amounts of sterling and they wanted to spend them to buy useful things for their nations and for their economy. But Britain, uh, British government understood that if all these uh, sterling are put at the market, so the sterling exchange rate would go down. So uh, to maintain the proper exchange rate of the sterling, the Bank of England agreed that it would have big reserves, $2 billion, and each month it would declare that it has the reserves of this particular value. Is it clear? Uh, and so when uh, uh, the invasion started, 
heavy speculations against Stalin uh, emerged just the day after the troops landed, when para para troops landed on Sinai Peninsula, and uh, the Bank of England was very unhappy with two facts. First. Uh, the French government that also participated in this invasion was wiser than uh, their British colleagues be because before the invasion, just when uh, French government had negotiations, secret negotiations about the future invasion, they asked IMF for credit and the Brits didn't do it. Then they committed another mistake. They did not tell the Americans about the secret negotiations. So it was a great surprise, the start of this invasion for the US government. And the United States thought that their partner behaved as, uh, as if it wasn't a par partner. And there was ma one more uh, acute situation in 1956. Who remembers? Political scientists. Yes, the Russian army entered Budapest because after the death of Stalin in 1953 there was um, a kind of, um, you know, easing of the regime in the USSR and also in many socialist countries. And so people there thought that, okay, there is a good chance for restoring democracy. And so in Hungary it started and uh, the uh, Hungarian people uh, wanted to have uh, another government and multi-party system. And so uh, you see here uh, uh, in this list, so Hungarian uh, uprising and Khrushchev sent troops to Hungary just in October 1956. Moreover, the US uh, President Eisenhower uh, waited uh, for presidential elections and uh, the U.S. anti-colonial foreign policy was aimed mainly at uh, the Commonwealth, uh, at the British Commonwealth, because they wanted to dismantle special relationship between uh, Britain and other European parent states or, or metropolis and their dependent ter territories. As you know, at that time, uh, France had Alger Algeria and uh, it uh, also was involved in uh, the war in Vietnam. And uh, there was a Belgian Congo, also known for many unhappy events there. So, what happened uh, after the spawn sterling started to decrease? Uh, uh, the decision was found by the Americans, by the American government. United Kingdom received uh, 1.3 billion credit from the IMF, it was an instruction of the United States, and uh, half a billion uh, credit from the export input American bank. And so this money, you see it was nearly 2 uh, billion. Uh, this money helped uh, the pound sterling to stabilize its rate. That is a quotation from the book written by Margaret Thatcher many, many years uh, after the crisis. The conclusion drawn by most of the British political class was understandable that Britain could no longer rely on the United States and that as the Commonwealth adopted a diminishing political importance, I like this, you know, this very polite expression, uh, it was necessary instead, instead to join the European common market. So uh, the British political class understood that it couldn't rely on the United States and that it was high time to have closer relations with the uh, European partners. So during the Cold War there were other uh, cases or examples of uh, foreign exchange of current turbulences mainly connected with, uh, with the colonial wars that France, for instance, had and Belgium had. Uh, Well-organized working class that after the war wanted to have better social uh, environment that uh, it had before the war and a strong left parties. Uh, you see the, on the photograph uh, a post, uh, poster 
in one of the streets of Italy, Vota Comunista, and uh, especially this story was in charge of the Italian current account crisis and uh, Lira crisis in 1963-64 uh, when the new government uh, who was the, uh, the, the vice president? Giovanni, in 1963. I have forgotten the family name. Okay. Uh, the new government uh, came to power and they had to fulfill the, uh, um, their promises to, uh, to uh, spend more on social programs. When somebody recalls the name of the... Uh, no, no, it wasn't very funny. Okay, uh, probably we shall recall. Um, so, uh, the Italy had to have great spendings and the Italian lira went down and nobody within the European economic community wanted to help Euro, to help lira and so finally... Moro, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so finally the United States helped them. What were all these examples about? They were about the simple fact that even during the fixed rate era there were currency crises and that most of the triggers were not within the European economic community. All the triggers were uh, within EU, within the US, USSR relationship and uh, the wars or proxy wars connected with the Cold War. So, next uh, part of our lecture is about 70s. You see the cartoon from uh, this website, uh, a good one, they have uh, materials, documents and also some cartoons, uh, is about uh, higher exchange rate volatility and about a higher prices for oil. Do you know what is the person depicted here? Nixon. Yeah, President Nixon and this is uh, Europe on the bull, probably on the Torino bull. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so twofold pressure on European currencies. Uh, the first uh, the first thing that happened in on August 15, 1971 was the declaration of President Nixon that there will be no uh, free uh, and fixed exchange market between the US dollar and the gold. Uh, Nixon co closed the so-called gold window and uh, it is known from the um, from the uh, documents of the White House uh, that when Nixon was asked what would happen to the Italian lira now, he said that let Italian lira go to hell. He used a more strong expression, I would not quote it. Uh, so on March 1973, that was the end of the official end of the Bretton Woods power value system, it didn't exist anymore, and so the world started to live within the flexible exchange rates. And now uh, I have a question to you. What do you think? When uh, flexible exchange rates started, this new situation was uh, more risky for the United States or for uh, Western Europe. Who ran the biggest risks of floating exchange rates? United States are European countries, Western European countries, because Eastern European countries had inconvertible currencies at that time. Europe, of course. Europe? Yeah. Why Europe? Guys. Why Europe? Well, the falling currencies were connected to the dollar. Uh, well, and then, well, dollar... Much easier, much easier. What is your name? Uh, Constantine. Constantine, much easier. Uh, do American states uh, trade with each other in different currencies or in one currency? In one currency. So within the large intra-US market, there is no exchange rate risks. 
There are no Texas dollar, no California dollar, but within the European economic uh, community founded in 1957, there were different currencies and they reacted differently to these new situations. Some of them went up like German mark and some of them like French franc and Italian lira went down. And what it meant to the exporters? I need a volunteer who would be the, the exporter in 1973 of German photo cameras. Please, Constantin. Okay, okay. So you have to export photo cameras from Germany to Italy. Uh, in what currency you would like to have the contract? What will be the invoice currency of your contract? dollars. <laughs> but okay, if it is not dollars. No, it will be Deutschmarks. Why Deutschmarks? No, because it's my currency and uh, I will put the Deutschmarks, I will be able to well, improve my production. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Let us have Constantine. I, I like these uh, two young ladies with the computer. Uh, if you are exporters of German uh, photo cameras to Italy, uh, in which currency you will have to pay the rent of your factory or plant and salaries for your workers? Oh. Yeah. If you are an exporter and you are a producer of photo cameras in Germany, in which currency you will have to pay salaries? In German marks, in Deutsche marks, exactly. So the uh, logic is very simple. The exporter wants to have its national currency to pay for the electricity, for workers' labor, for and for everything. You know? So they want a contract in German marks. But now let us see this situation from the point of view of the Italian uh, importer, who is, for instance, the owner of uh, the uh, shops that sell these photo cameras. In which, in which uh, currency they want to have the contract? Any ideas? In liras. Why in liras? In order to buy something in Deutschmarks, you should get the Deutschmarks first. Yeah, this is true. This is true. There are problems with the exchange uh -huh. rates. So it's yeah. They would like to have a contract in Italian levers because when they pay in German marks and then they sell cameras here in Italy and only in one month or two months or three months or half a year they get this money back and if during this period the Italian lira depreciates with regard to the German mark they will not cover their original expenses. Is this clear? Really? Yeah, yeah that is the core point. So, it meant that after the switch to the floating exchange rate, the intra-European trade was at great risk because countries with strong currencies wouldn't like to have contracts in soft currencies and vice versa. So nobody wanted to trade with the other or they wanted to trade again in dollars. So here you see the nominal effective exchange rates. Uh, these statistics is given by the Bank for International Settlements and 1964 is 0 or 100. So you see here the devaluation of the uh, sterling of 1968 and then it was more or less stable until 1970, 1971, and then, then the real divergence happens after 1973. You see that the German mark goes up, the uh, uh, Netherlands Gilde also goes up, but in a moderate, in a more moderate pace. Uh, this is also true. Oh, I don't know why we have two. Probably this is Belgian franc. I do not know. Yes, it is Belgian franc. Uh, this is French franc. 
uh, it is rather volatile. Italian lira goes down and the sterling pound, pound sterling also goes down. Does anybody wa know what is effective exchange rate? I don't expect you as uh, I learned it only after I was 20 years an economist. Uh, so effective exchange rate is, but you will sometimes see it in textbooks and that's why it is good to understand. Uh, Okay, if we speak about Italian lira, uh, there are many exchange rates. It might be an exchange rate towards German mark, towards uh, American dollar, towards Russian ruble, or to, uh, towards uh, Indonesian currency. I do not remember what is the name. Ringgit? No. Uh, so, Italian lira could appreciate to certain currencies like yen or like Russian ruble or Ukrainian hryvnia, and it may depreciate towards US dollar or towards uh, uh, German mark. So the question for the economists is where is the Italian lira just now? Is it depreciating or appreciating? So to, to do uh, a comprehensive analysis, the Bank for International Settlement makes a basket of currencies and calcul calculates the rate uh, towards this basket and the uh, values of each currencies, they coincide with the values or shares, shares of each currency uh, coincides with the share of this or that particular country in Italy's foreign trade. That is a very simple and good approach. So if Italian lira appreciates with regard to Japanese yen and there is a great trade between Italy and Japan, so the effective exchange rate would go up and vice versa. Uh, okay, so the European response. Even before the end of the Bretton Woods, there were attempts to create a European monetary union. Why? Because uh, the start of the European economic community was very successful, the uh, agricultural, the common agricultural currency, also the common agricultural policy started in 1962, and the common uh, trade policy started, who knows, common trade policy of the European uh, economic community, common trade policy, and common tariff towards third countries. In 1968. I like, I like it. Russian students know, the, yeah. <laughs> know these uh, dates. So, and uh, there was a belief that, okay, we have uh, had a good start and we can go ahead. Uh, but before the collapse of the Bretton Woods, uh, Pierre Werner, he was the Prime Minister of Luxembourg, uh, and the Minister of Finance uh, presented uh, a so-called Werner Plan or Plan of Constructing the European Monetary Union, uh, but it failed because of the collapse of the Bretton Woods. So in 1972, one part of the Werner Plan, and here is the Werner itself, once I listened to his speech at one of the conferences, uh, he died in the year 2002, uh, nearly at the age of 90. Uh, the currency snake or snake in the tunnel uh, was established, so it is, it is a target zone or a currency corridor, as we call it in Russian. So there are certain margins within which the currency can fluctuate. And if it depreciates, so the central bank starts uh, foreign exchange uh, interventions to keep it within these margins. So at least within these margins, current countries had some predictability. And the margin was very, very no, uh, narrow for, even for that period of time. It was 2.25% it was from the central world. So, but nevertheless, the uh, problem of a uh, trade deficit existed within the uh, European econ economic community. Here you see uh, the statistics uh, got from the Jungtat start, 
those who like figures I would strongly recommend because they have good statistics and you can make a selection for certain countries and even for my former students uh, who studied political uh, systems uh, when they wrote their master degrees I told them look at your country's profile and you looked at start and, may, and make a supplement for your master's dissertation your teachers would be happy to see that you know figures. So, uh, you see the situation. Germany also was uh, in, uh, in uh, black, so its uh, trade balance was positive because it was very competitive and most of other countries were in red, so they had trade deficits. And for sure when a country had a trade deficit it means that Nobody wants its currency, and its currency goes down. It is a very simple explanation, but uh, it really works. And so, because of this situation, within the European economic community, the German mark always went up, and it was very, very difficult to keep these currencies within these very narrow margins. Uh, so uh, that is why uh, after five years of functioning, the European snake in a tunnel was nearly, uh, you know, came to its end. The French franc devalued two or three times and it was clear that it was not impossible to continue in the same way. So the European monetary system started to operate in 1979. There was the same exchange rate mechanism plus the European currency unit itself uh, instead of the dollars and uh, the European Monetary Cooperation Fund started to give uh, money for foreign exchange interventions for those uh, countries whose currency started to devalue, devaluate mainly for France and Italy. Uh, so there were two more instruments that are clear for economists, but I would not overload you with these technical uh, things. So the main objective of the European monetary system was to safeguard European intra-regional trade flows, to save the trade within the European economic community. Also to anchor inflation expectations, because after the oil shocks, when did they happen? When did the First oil shock happened. 1970? 73, exactly. 1973, then there was another oil shock. Somebody could help me? 78, 79, exactly, exactly. So, and these induced inflation in the European Union or future European Union. Prices went up and the level of prices was very high, especially in France and in Italy. The inflation climbed up to 20, sometimes 25% per year. That is something very, very big for today's uh, understanding. Um, and there was one more objective of this European monetary system to uh, maintain the fixed rates or nearly the fixed rate system. That was the integration itself. You can really rarely read about this, but this is 100% true. And the politicians, uh, political leaders of the European Union know this for sure. So uh, why it was very important to have fixed rates, because the common agricultural policy that uh, functioned uh, since 1962, as well as common uh, EU budget that started in 1970, and regional funds, they all operated in a cube. And if exchange rates go down and up, it means that let it be France that gets subsidy from the Common Agricultural Fund, FIOGA. It means that they get this money in a queue, and when they devaluate the French franc, their farmers are in a much better position because, in fact, they get more French francs than it was expected. Is it clear? 
And that would be a reason for Germany to be very angry because they would say, you put your farmers in a more uh, beneficial position than our farmers are. That would be a constant source of political wars and contradictions within European political leaders. So they needed fixed rates to preserve integration mechanism itself. So these were challenges of uh, high prices, inflation and uh, flexible exchange rates. But that was not the whole story. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, there were strong exchange controls after the Second World War and uh, the um, movement of capitals was not free even within the European Union until the beginning of the 90s. So if you as an investor wanted to buy shares or government bonds of another state, you had to get special permission of your government. So capitals did not cross borders easily. And that was also a kind of stabilizer for currencies. How it happened, I'll show you now. Uh, you know that uh, in 1985, the European Union got, uh, or the European Economic Community, got a new president of the European Commission, that was Charles Delors, uh, a French uh, economist and uh, politician, and uh, he decided to, you know, create a huge project to revitalize the European integration that was in a period of eurosclerosis uh, since uh, the beginning of the 70s. And uh, that uh, huge and very appealing project was the European single market. It was uh, strongly supported by other European leaders and that is even more important by European companies, especially multinationals. They saw that it would be very useful for them to have a big European market that would be similar to the market Americans have without any dividing lines and borders. And multinationals supported that project and so the, the law had a very good support from both uh, other political leaders and from uh, the companies from the business. So the idea was to reach gradual removal of capital controls and uh, to have so-called four freedoms, free movement of goods that already <coughs> existed uh, within the uh, European economic community, services, citizens and capitals. And so the internal market was completed by 1992 uh, and uh, <coughs> Four years ago, the Delors committed, uh, Commission uh, prepared a report that paved the way to the European Monetary Union. But why uh, the movement of capitals was dangerous for the fixed rates? I will answer you just it in a moment. Uh, and here you see some, uh, uh, some facts about the European monetary crisis of 19... 92-93, that was really a very severe crisis. Uh, the Maastricht Treaty was signed in feb February 1992, and after that the uh, procedure of, how to say, so the uh, national parliaments have to approve it. What is the English word? Ratification. The ratification procedure started and uh, the Danes voted against uh, the Maastricht Treaty and the European Monetary Union. And that was a signal for the foreign exchange markets. So heavy speculation started against softer or weaker currencies. Italian Lira, Spanish uh, Peseta, Portuguese uh, Escuda, uh, Irish pound and Greek drachma. So all of them were devaluated in 1993 and heavy speculations against French franc continued for nine months 
And so uh, European Central Banks spent $150 billion to support the French franc and to avoid the French franc's devaluation. So at the end of the crisis in 1993, Britain left the exchange rate mechanism that was a part of the European monetary system and Italy left this system too. So the currencies were not any more fixed or pegged to the EQ, European Currency Union. Uh, that was a clear signal that the system of nearly fixed European exchange rates could not exist anymore because the abilities of speculators are so huge. Why it happened? I'll show you uh, this simple graph. So on uh, the black bars are daily exchange turnover on the foreign exchange markets or currency markets. It means this uh, exchange turnover means that or exchange markets are markets when you change one currency for another, when banks change one currency for another. For another. In Russia we call it currency markets. Uh, so this is the daily turnover. And this is the grain bars of the daily GDP. The daily, uh, the world's daily GDP. So you see that this comparison was for the uh, exchange markets. So the idea is that during the 80s and especially during the 90s, the exchange markets grew very quickly because of the liberal liberalization of uh, exchange controls not only in Europe but all over in the world. At the end of the uh, 80s, you know, the European, the uh, USSR collapsed and the socialist system collapsed and so the currencies of Russia, of Baltic states, of Czechoslovakia, Poland became convertible. It also uh, happened with the currencies of many Asian states, especially Southern Asian states. So this convertibility of many previously inconvertible or soft currencies uh, created a big demand for US dollar. And so the growth of the exchange markets was very, very speedy, much speedier than the GDP growth and then the growth of foreign trade and then the growth of foreign exchange reserves the central banks had. Because the official of foreign exchange reserves of the central banks is the fund from which money is taken when your national currency goes down. Is it clear? Or you have lost uh, the, uh, the logics already? So the idea is that the foreign exchange markets started to develop very quickly and the uh, central banks could not uh, accumulate official reserves with the same speed. So they were doomed to failure in a game started by Soros and other speculators. So it was impossible to keep the system of fixed exchange rates in Europe anymore because of these huge uh, foreign exchange markets. So, it was the Italian economist Tommaso Padis Chioppa, and I had the privilege to know him and to have several meetings with him, who was the first to understand this uh, new situation. And he uh, used to study together with Delors at the same university. And so uh, he explained to Delors that there was no other opportunity. Uh, that, in fact, there were two choices. To uh, cease the functioning of the European uh, monetary system and to let European currencies fluctuate and that means to ruin the European intra-regional trade or to create a single currency, do not have any more national currencies. Uh, 
That is a very, uh, very important thing for economists. That is called impossible trinity. Uh, you can find it in every economic textbook and in every textbook on international finance. I'll try to explain you in a simpler words. So, uh, it means that you may have two options of three. Fixed exchange rate and independent monetary policy when the central bank state, uh, chooses the interest rate it likes. Or the open capital account, so free movement of capital and fixed exchange rate, but no independent monetary policy. So, uh, Odis Kyopa explained to Delors that in the new situation, when the uh, Single European Act created the free movement of capital, and uh, when fixed exchange rate uh, existed, so the national banks of the European currencies could not anymore have independent monetary policy, so their own interest rates. So it meant that they had to have very close cooperation between national central banks. And if this is true, it would be much better to have the single or the common central bank. So why the single European uh, currency and the central European bank? Foreign exchange markets have become too sizable. Central banks' official reserves were not sufficient anymore to conduct effective foreign exchange interventions. And through free movement of capitals uh, undermined the uh, possibility of national central banks to conduct independent uh, interest rate policy. So, this is the story of uh, the uh, of the 90s, uh, and that meant that the European single currency was the only outcome of the situation. And now I have a list of uh, a list of uh, functions that, according to my understanding the euro fulfills at the global stage. Uh, you will have these, uh, these slides on your website, and so I will ask uh, Giovanni to put it on your website. Uh, first, the European currency helped to cushion external shocks that happened even before the rise of globalization, even in the 90s and in the 60s. Uh, the common currency eliminates the possibility of exchange rate fluctuations. There is no more national currencies and so the headache of uh, going up and going out, uh, down exchange rates, it safeguards the intra-regional European trade because without the single currency it would inevitably ruin. It also protects EU policies from foreign exchange and political risks. So, uh, all European funds that now operate in euros and previously in EQs are uh, safeguarded from foreign exchange risks and it means from political risks. Uh, the euro also prevents currency substitution. Does anybody here know of what is currency substitution? Uh, do you know what is dollarization? I'll ask these two girls I like more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, what is dollarization? Uh, when the dollar is sent as a currency in which you exchange, like the compare, compare to other currency, you uh -huh. The process of doing. Okay, you are very, very close to uh, to the right answer. You please. Is it when you have uh, two currencies that choose to trade in the dollar because it's a more stable currency? Uh huh. Uh huh. More stable or more probably desired or appealing no. currency? Yeah, yeah. So uh, in fact, 
dollarization happens in two, uh, I should say, versions. The better version is when a country has its foreign trade and uh, when its uh, exports and its imports are not in the national currency but in the foreign currency. This is a so-called Grassmann's law. Uh, Grassmann was uh, a Swedish uh, economist that started the contract signed by, uh, by Swedish companies and he saw that in exports the share of Swedish crown was higher than in imports. And that is a normal rule that uh, when the goods are sent to another or exported to another country, normally the exporter has the right to choose the currency and vice versa. That is why in imports normally a country has a larger share of foreign currencies than in its exports. And this is also true for European economies because uh, moreover, because of this, uh, beyond this Grassmann's, uh, Grassmann's law, uh, European countries, many of them, import oil. And oil and all other commodities are quoted in dollars. So prices for oil are in dollars and normally European companies pay for oil also in dollars. So when the national currency is not used for the foreign trade of the country, it is not good, but normally it has certain share in its foreign trade. And uh, you can easily understand that for key currencies or for reserve currencies this share is bigger. For instance, for Euro, European countries normally quote up to 50% of their foreign trade in Euros and the rest is in dollars and in the Japanese yen and in some other not so popular currencies. Uh, for pound sterling, a certain part, probably up to 50%, is in pound sterling and the rest is in dollars and other currencies. But if you look at the foreign trade of uh, countries with uh, weaker currencies, like for instance Russia, the share of the Russian ruble in Russia's foreign trade is nearly neglectable. It is uh, probably 5%, so we trade in Russian rubles with uh, our uh, closest neighbors like uh, Belarus, like uh, Armenia or Kazakhstan, and that is all, because nobody uh, beyond this area wants Russian ruble. Uh, this is also true for Indonesia and actually for many other countries. But that is the softer uh, version of dollarization. The harder version is when inside uh, your internal payments you use dollar or euro instead of, of your national currency. This happens in the periods of hyper or high inflation. It happened in my country in the 90s when the ruble was not stable at all. So inside the country even, you know, uh, shops wanted to get dollars, and that was amazing. It meant that the Bank of Russia could not control the situation, because within the country you have foreign currency. This also happened for many countries of former Yugoslavia, and, uh, you know, now, for instance, in Hungary, if you look at the uh, currency structure of uh, bank accounts, you will see a big proportion of uh, bank accounts in euros, not in Hungarian format. So these are two phases of dollarization. Why I am speaking here about dollarization or currency substitution, that is the economic term. In Argentina maybe as well, no? Yes, yeah. yeah. So, uh, even in the 70s, when the era of floating exchange rates started, countries like Greece and Italy could not trade in their national currencies, even with their European partners. So when Italy sold goods 
to Germany. It, it had two options, to sign a contract in uh, German marks or in dollars. When Italy sent uh, or exported its uh, goods to France, it had to sign a contract in dollars. And it meant that with, when this situation would continue, especially with uh, the higher foreign exchange fluctuations, it meant that the dollar would occupy a huge share of intra-European trade. And that was a real risk, not only economic, but from the geopolitical and political point of view for European leaders. So now this problem does not exist. And that is for sure the achievement of the euro. And the euro is more stable than most of national EU currencies, probably besides the German mark, but it is much more stable than uh, previous Italian lira, Greek drachma, Portuguese escudo, Spanish peseta, and even French franc. So these are the positive uh, qualities of the euro, and uh, they both have the economic and political and geopolitical dimension. So according to my understanding, the euro really helps the uh, European, current, uh, European countries to manage globalization. I will be happy to answer your question, to hear your critics, and uh, to have a vivid discussion. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so let's open the floor as usual. And uh, not the first question is from me, if I may. That is, you know that according to uh, to what you have said, no, uh, you know that uh, in 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 Italy there is uh, uh, you know a strong debate uh, and an amazing debate uh, on uh, on leaving the eurozone. No? So what according to what you have said, what uh, would it happen to Italy and uh, to the Italian economy, for example? This is just an example, okay? Yes, according to what you said. Uh, I think that our students would be, uh, you know, would, uh, would help me to answer this question. Uh, so let us, uh, let us imagine that all of us have good friends among the members of the Italian uh, government and we know that in a week the, Itali the Italy will leave the Eurozone. Uh, what will we do with uh, our uh, government bonds uh, issued by the Italian government? Uh, by the Italian government. What will we do with the uh, Italian uh, shares we have uh, on our bank accounts? We will, we, all of us are very clever. We have a very good sense of <laughs> profit and possible loss. All of us we will send uh, these uh, government bonds and shares quoted in the, uh, issued by the Italian companies and this will mean that the new exchange rate of the uh, newly introduced Italian lira will go up or down? Down. So if this uh, exchange rate goes down so the uh, public debt of Italy that accounts to 130 percent, yeah, 120. I do not remember the exact. Uh, the exact 30, 36, 30, maybe 36, some, yeah, yeah, something like this. Uh, this debt was created in the period when euro existed, so it would have been to it. So it would be necessary to pay it back in euros. And if the Italian lira goes down, 
and it devaluates by, let it be 20%, so it means that this debt increases by 20%. And that is true for everything. So the indebtedness of Italian economy, of Italian companies, will increase dramatically. The cost of this experiment would be awful. And moreover, the Italian government would have to pay again for changing cash machines and all things that are necessary to print national money again. This is not a free of charge, you know, uh, uh, exercise. So the cost of this uh, experiment would be very, very high and nobody would trust the Italian government once anymore. So that would be a social crisis in the country because it would not be possible to finance uh, pensions, to finance the uh, budget deficit and uh, to pay, uh, to pay uh, money for those who are unemployment and to finance uh, education. Oh. Convincing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> because all of us are clever. We know what to do with the government policy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other comments or questions or what else? Don't be shy. I will yes. not, you know, put marks at your exams. You will yeah. not see me <laughs> in two or three years. <laughs> so you may ask any question you like and uh, criticize what has been said today. No risks for you. Yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, so, <clears throat> this whole thing is election. Um, from your point of view, are there any considerable profits for the de-dollarization of the uh, world economy? De-dollarization of? Of the uh, world economy. I mean, uh, of the world economy? Yeah, I mean, at this part. Because, for example, uh, Russia and China uh, recently have uh, <coughs> uh, have uh, started uh, trading with each other in national currencies, in the uh, in in mm -hmm. um, And uh, if I'm not mistaken, the share of uh, Europe of the yuan in the uh, multi-currency uh, basket, the uh, IMF multi-currency basket, has increased uh, since uh, yeah, in, in yeah. the century. So. Uh, um, so, uh, actually, the problem of de-dollarization of our world economy is uh, a very difficult one. I will try to explain it to you in simpler words. So, look, uh, when um, you have a currency like US dollar that is uh, wished by everybody, it means that when you change dollar for euros or change dollar for uh, Japanese yen or change dollar for um, Southern African rand, the price for this operation is very, very small because the market of the dollar is big. So it is economies of scale. Uh, we economists call this uh, different spread you can see it when you walk along the street and uh, see at the exchange rates even for the retail currency markets. You see that the buy rate and sell rate are not the same. Do you understand it? So this difference depends on the uh, amount of the market for this or that particular currency. If, for instance, you want here staying in Italy to buy the currency of uh, Uzbekistan and then to sell it, uh, in these two operations you will nearly lose everything because the spread would be up to 40 or 50 percent. So you first buy it and then you sell it and you get nothing. Uh, but if you do it with American dollars, you can do it many times because the spread, spread is very narrow. This is also true for the market where not people but banks operate. Uh, 
And this means that this is a vicious circle. When the spread is small, everybody wishes to have this currency and the currency becomes a vehicle currency. Do you know what is vehicle? Vehicle is... Uh, um, you may call vehicle uh, a car or a bicycle, so something that moves the trade. So the vehicle currency is a, is a currency through which foreign exchange transactions are done. If I in Russia want to sell Russian rubles and to buy Australian dollars, I will not find uh, a person in Australia or a bank in Australia that needs Russian rubles. So I will first sell rubles, buy dollars, American dollars and then buy Australian dollars, because these two markets, both of them, are very liquid and operations happen there every minute. So, and this creates a huge demand for American currency. If you look at the statistics of the Bank for International Settlements, I gave you some figures uh, here on this slide. So today, the amount of the Mm, foreign exchange to nowhere is five trillion dollars a day. And who will give me the figure of the uh, GDP, world GDP? It depends on the type of, on the mode of cal calculation, so 75, 80, 75, 80 trillion dollars. And here you have five trillion every day. Every day, just just imagine, and now you will. The person who will stop me first will be the winner. Uh, so listen to the figures. Eighty-eight percent of this market is dominated by the dollar. Thirty-two percent by the euro about 20% of pound sterling and the Japanese yen and the share of the yuan is 4%, the share of the Russian ruble is 1% and most of other currencies have nearly 1%. So, who have uh, spot the mistake? More than 100%. More than 100, okay. Normally, students in um, Gimo say, Professor, you are not correct. Uh, so, this is uh, the, the total sum is 200%. This is the methodology of the Bank for International Settlements. Why? Because when, if you divide it by two, because uh, every deal has two currencies. One currency is sold and the other currency is bought. If you divide it, you lose the economic sense. Because when I say you that 88% of this currency market belongs to the dollar, it means that in 88 deals out of 100, the dollar is sold or bought, or sold and bought. Do you understand? That, so 88 deals out of 100, they are deals with dollar. And only, only 12 are without dollar, like yen is exchanged for euros, euros are exchanged for uh, Swedish crown, Swedish crown is exchanged for Norwegian crown and things like that. So it is very difficult now because of this vicious circle to outcrowd the dollar out of the foreign uh, exchange trade, but I believe that with new technologies uh, some structural uh, changes may happen. Any other questions? Yes, I have, because I'm ignorant, so I like to, yeah, and so I have another, you know, uh, another question about uh, the relations between uh, currencies and foreign policies. That is, to what extent a currency can be an instrument of foreign policy? Could you provide some examples about the dollar and the US on the one hand, and could Europe, Europe 
use the euro as an instrument of EU foreign policy, for example? Uh, okay. Mm. Uh, first, I'd like to probably start with the dollar. Uh, as I pointed at the beginning of my presentation to you, uh, that the Bretton Woods um, agreement was signed in June or July, July 1944. Uh, it was the decision of the U.S. administration to uh, to call this. Uh, or to organize this conference be before the end of the war. And uh, thanks to that, they got at least two great, huge advantages. First advantage was that many countries were not uh, attending the conference. If it was after the Second World War, so Germany and all other occupied countries could attend the conference and could propose their own ways of organizing the international financial system. Second, you know that the Bretton Woods uh, agreement was the result of an intellectual battle between the uh, Harry Dexter White, the person in the uh, Ministry of Finance in uh, the US, and John uh, and Keynes. Keynes. Oh. So the Keynes proposed the International Clearing Union that was much more beneficial for the international trade. I would not go into detail now, those who are interested, please read. And the Keynes' main idea was to put a limit, to put a limit to, uh, to trade deficits. Uh, I showed you here. He said that, okay, let us agree on the certain limits and so we will not have the heavy problems of uh, foreign exchange uh, fluctuations. But the Americans were interested in putting the dollar in the center of the new international monetary system and on fixing the rates to the dollar. That made the dollar a currency nearly like gold. So everybody needed it. And that was a very, very important advantage for the Americans. And since now, they use this advantage. As for the uh, euro and European currencies, when in 1960 Greece signed uh, a preferential agreement with uh, the European Economic Community, there were two articles there on the credits given on the loans given to Greece, to Greek government, and they were in US dollars. And that was a huge, you know, uh, I should say, uh, how to put it, uh, that was uh, the very irritating point in this agreement. And next time when Greece signed similar agreement with the European Commission, uh, it was uh, in uh, European currency uh, units or, and then in a queues. So all financial assistance the European Union provides for ACP countries, for you know, uh, countries of uh, common neighborhood, they are all in euros. So from this point of view, the euro is also a political instrument. Uh -huh. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, staying here in Italy, I cannot help uh, recall, uh, recollecting the story of, of the uh, coin issued in Florence in the year... What is the English? In the middle of the 13th century, it was 1253. Uh, don't ask me. Yeah. So Florence issued a golden coin with the weight 3.5 and then Genio, Genoa, how do you call it? Genoa. Genoa uh, repeated this, uh, currency, uh, this coin. It was stable for 500 years. It was a vehicle currency and a real true international currency 
for 500 years because it was stable and uh, because uh, the uh, cities that issued it were very, very rich and so everybody wanted to have this currency. So that is the story I wanted to recall staying here in Italy. Okay. Uh, uh, what time is it? Okay, so we have two minutes, something like this. If you have uh, other questions or, or comments or Or disagreements. Disagreements, <laughs> yes. Go with that. Yes? I have a question. Well, uh, well, in fresh, well, one of the most recent trends right now are uh, so-called cyber currencies. And, well, do you think that they have some kind of uh, prospect, any prospects in international trade or something that kind? Mm. I will be sure not to steal uh, your... Uh, the free time. No. I think no. My position is no. Okay. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, those who are interested, write down Project Syndicate. This is a very good resource of uh, short papers produced by best uh, contemporary thinkers. The texts are short normally two or three pages and you can you know uh, search the uh, the topics you like the they have uh, big you know portions of politics economics project syndicate and uh, there are certain articles uh, about uh, these uh, currencies uh, bitcoins on project syndicates and uh, recent recent uh, recent uh, estimations is that its future is not very clear to put it softly. Softly. Okay. So thank, thank you, you all guys. Thank you, thank you very much. much.